So my name is Dan Garcia. This is my electric unicycle I used to ride around campus. I wanted to just welcome you all and warm up the crowd a little bit before we start our official program and show a video and get you guys going. I am so excited you guys are here. How far away did you come? Let me get a sense of who came the farthest. Who? Let me get some things. Oakland, that was pretty far. Good, good. Skyline. Not, not. Skyline. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me have the teachers raise their hand. Let me have the teachers raise their hand. How far did the teachers come? Let me get a sense. Go. Say, say, say it loud so everybody can hear. Go. Teachers only. Go. San Lorenzo, Hayward. San Ramon. Oakland, more, more, more. That's okay. Pittsburgh, all right, good. Albany is in the house. Go. Martinez, I love it. South. Hayward, go. San Jose. That's pretty far, it's pretty far. Brentwood, all right, awesome, awesome. Any more, any more? Roseville, anybody else? Well, welcome everybody. What an exciting day, what an exciting group. Do you guys know what's happened this week? What the, what, like, why we're so excited about computer science this week? No, no idea, no idea, right? No sense, let me give, let me give you some context. Let me get, hopefully you, hopefully you had some conversation with your teachers about what's happening this week. This is CS Education Week worldwide. This isn't just Berkeley's doing something. This isn't just the United States. The entire world has CS Education Week. It's really exciting. Grace Hopper's birthday is this week. And so we're celebrating Hopper's birthday this week. She was one of the early computer scientists. And so the hour, you guys heard of the hour code? Hour code, yeah? Hour code, you probably know this when you were younger. Hour code started as a really small project of Hadi Partovi. He's founded code.org. Have you heard of code.org? Yeah. Okay, so they had these online exercises. Actually, it started, you should hear Hadi's story. He has a TED talk all about this. He started by just making a video. He, he, was a, he has a former connection to a lot of software developers, and so he knew a lot of CEOs. And so he made a video with some celebrities and some CEOs, this is I think five years ago, where it was just like a one minute video. And it turns out he actually made some connection and got this video to be played in half of the nation's theaters. Like as the previews, when you go to the movies, you see previews, they show this mini video, we'll show you here. So this is a version of the video, they've edited some more and added some more people, but it's an incredible inspirational video talking about the power of computer science and why computer science is the future, why more people should learn computer science, why not enough kids are learning it, why not enough kids get access to it, a lot of kind of like getting the, the movement started. He didn't have any intention to do anything about a website or anything more than that, anything about state advocacy. Now, he is the top, he is the CEO of, of the Code.org program that has, in the last five years, now had more than 150 million kids a year going through the Hour of Code tutorial. This is just getting an Hour of Code. This is not like a full course, this is not a full semester, or a full degree. This is just getting a little taste of how much fun it is to program, how much fun it is to get engaged with computer science, and maybe that starts a spark in each student who says, wait, I wanna take some more courses about that. I wanna say, learn more. What can I do? Where can I go? Maybe it, it starts parents to advocate for getting computer science into their schools. Obviously, you all have computer science in your schools, and that's awesome, but not all of you had computer science in your schools 10 years back, 15 years back. So, and there are many schools that aren't represented today that don't have any computer science in their schools still in the Bay Area. We need to do something about this. Where, what's the issue? Well, there's an issue of enough computer science teachers to go around. They, they have to be paid well, and they have to be supported, and they have to come through a lot of, states, a lot of education schools, so that has to happen. We have to support professional development to make sure that student, these teachers get regular updates and supported by universities, by other teachers, and a lot of groups that are doing the nonprofits in that space. We have to have parents get on board and like break, you know, rattle down the doors of, of the of principals and the district superintendents, people control, control these things to say, we need to bring computer science into our school if it's not, it's amazing. So I'm really, really excited that you are kind of when the flowers bloom, there are no flowers in some high schools, because as, as I said, something, sometimes it's not there, but the flowers have bloomed in your schools, you're here, you're taking exciting computer science courses, and we are at Berkeley delighted to bring you to campus to have an amazing day that's supposed to show off basically the best and the brightest of what you can do with computer science education, hopefully to continue to spur that interest so that you'll think, A, you're definitely going to college, and B, you're going to college, hopefully at Cal, C, hopefully you're going to college and doing computing, and in the best case, you're going to computing at Cal, and they'll see you here for the next four years. So that's gonna be really exciting. How many of you guys wanna to come to Cal to computing? Computer science, huh? Let's get some love in the room. All right, great, great, great. So, 
We would love to have you. We would love to have you. So please do apply. Don't let anybody, don't let the haters tell you, ah, oh, you'll never get in. Please apply. You never know what the admissions folks are looking for. So please do apply to all the top schools. You never know what's going to happen. Please shoot for the moon. Okay. So today is going to be a really exciting day. My job is just to warm you up before the official speakers come in. And thank you so much for, for coming and giving some presentations. Also, folks are coming in and slowly uh, filtering in the room. The day is going to be really full. We're going to have an opening plenary, which means it's kind of a moot meeting where you have welcome speak speeches and some welcome time for that. You're going to get a free t-shirt. Many of you are wearing it now. Please wear it loud and proud today. It's really exciting. We're going to have about 500 students here today. It's really incredible. The plan is going to be, after the opening plenary, we're going to go and take an amazing photo of 500 people in front of the Campanile, which is our beautiful clock tower. You're going to say, go Bears, go computing. And we'll have a beautiful photo for that. We'll put that on our website. Then you're going to go get split into two groups, and you already know, the teachers know what group you're in, probably somewhere in your label you know whether you're group A or group B. One group is going to get a set of amazing, inspiring talks in Sibley Auditorium, which is kind of over there a little bit. And by the way, no rain. Thank goodness that there's no rain today. A year ago, we were all drenched when we had to go from A to B, so you guys are really, it's a little cold, but uh, you're not going to get rain done. So inspiring talks, which will be amazing. You're going to see some student presentations. We're going to see the best computer animation that my students have done. So I teach a class in computer animation. Those students often go to work for Pixar. So if you want to, the, the space of what you can do with computing is so rich and so creative. People say, computing's not creative. Computing is incredibly creative, from the people who are using it to make art to the people who are actually designing apps and designing programs. There's so much creativity in the engineering behind the software. People don't realize that creativity is one of the first and foremost things that we do as computer scientists. We also help change the world. So this video is going to help talk about that in a moment as well. So you're going to see awesome animation. You're going to see actually how my students make that animation. They're going to show you a 30 minute demo where they go from nothing, from Jump Street to a finished Pixar little mini short film in 30 minutes. It's going to be the entire process of how to do that. We're also going to have a talk about uh, from our, our top students. We have a course called the Beauty and Joy Computing. I'm happy to say that this course is now 54% women. It's amazing how many uh, exciting students are learning computer science through that course. The best student projects, we just, the course just ended on Friday, and we all had a, a gathering where we chose the best five projects. And those are going to be demoed to you by those students. And oftentimes, I want you to ask those students, when did you learn computer science? And those students who are going to show amazing demos, I can't tell you how exciting those, those projects are. We all saw them this weekend. The top five blew me away. I couldn't believe how good they were. And you ask each one of them, when did you start to program? And almost to a person, they're going to say, three months ago. And in three months, they're going to produce unbelievable. So what you can do with computing in just a little bit of time, if you just have the right tools and the right support, is unbelievable. It's just mind boggling Most of you have cell phones. Most of you have your favorite apps. All those apps are created by real people, just like yourself, who may not have thought computing is a career for them they wanted to do. But somebody got there, you know, got there, lit the fire for them, and they went to take a course, and another course, and maybe a major, maybe a minor. And next thing you know, they're working for a company. Next thing you know, they're making apps that the world, billions of people are using. Do you have any idea how many people are using Facebook? We're approaching two billion people using one program from one person who started in Harvard, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Just like you. Just like you're going to be in college. You guys are going to be in college in a year or two. Just like you, somebody said, I'd like, I'd like to make a, a way to connect people together. That was the social network movie. And next thing you know, two billion people are going to be using this program. Can you believe? There's seven billion people in the world, and two, two seventh of the entire world is using one person's program. Can you believe that effect? So computers can change the world and for many, many, many great reasons. There's also some social implications of computing that are unintended implications, right? There was a whole news thing about fake news on Facebook and how that's maybe changing our politics and changing the way people vote because we're being more polarized by this. So there's all these unintended implications of computing that we need to be thinking about. So hopefully you're taking classes and you're talking about those issues as well in your class. I am just so excited to, bring you, to welcome you here. 9.30, I'm right on time. I'm going to show this video. My name is Dan Garcia. You're going to see me, by the way, I didn't tell you what's going to happen. There's talks in the morning for one group, and then these exciting hands-on activities in the afternoon, and then they'll swap. So one group is going to get their hands-on activities in the morning, and you'll see me in the morning. Uh, I'm doing a game theory activity. It'll be really fun. Uh, and then you'll have the talks of the afternoon. The other, well, the other group will swap. So anyway, my name is Dan Garcia. I'll see you all day. I'll see many of you all throughout the day. I'm excited to have you here, 500 people. This is our fifth or sixth year doing this. 
Amazing. I'm so, so passionate. We started like 100, then 250. Now we have 500 and it packs all the rooms we have. It's just so done. And I want to, by the way, thank all the staff. Let's give a hand to the staff. They have put so much work together to make this happen. They are amazing. They are amazing. And you are amazing. The day is going to be great. The day is going to be great. It's going to be really great. That's my job. All right, here we go. Let me jump in this. Hope the sound is going to work. Should I just go and click the video? All right, here we go. And ladies and gentlemen, code.org. Welcome to the Hour of Code. I was 13 when I first got access to a, a computer. My parents bought me a... Uh a Macintosh in 1984 when I was eight years old. I was in sixth grade. I learned to code in college. Freshman year, first semester, um, intro to computer science. I wrote a program to play tic-tac-toe. I think it was pretty humble beginnings. I think the first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color? Or how old are you? I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. The first time I actually had something come up and say, hello world, and it, the, I made a computer do that, it was just astonishing. Learning how to program didn't start off as wanting to learn all of computer science or, um, or trying to master this discipline or anything like that. It just started off because I wanted to do this one simple thing. I wanted to make something that was fun for myself and, and my sisters. And I wrote this little program and then basically just add a little bit to it. And then when I needed to learn something new, I looked it up either in a book or on the internet and then added a little bit to it. It's really not unlike kind of playing an instrument or something or, 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 you know, or playing a sport. It starts out being very intimidating, but you kind of get the hang of it over time. Coding is something that can be learned, and um, I know it can be intimidating. A lot of things are intimidating, but, uh, you know, what isn't? A lot of the coding that people do is actually fairly simple. Um, it's, it's more about the process of breaking down problems than, uh, you know, sort of coming up with complicated algorithms as people traditionally think about it. You don't have to be a genius to know how to code. You need to be determined. Uh, Addition, subtraction, uh, that, that's about it. You should probably know your multiplication tables. <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to code. Do you have to be a genius to read? Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house, all of these things have been turned upside down by software. What it is is, you know, computers are, are everywhere. You want to work in agriculture? <laughs> Do you want to work in entertainment? Do you want to work in manufacturing? You know, it's, it's just all over. Here we are, 2013. We all depend on technology to communicate, to bank, information, and none of us know how to read and write code. When I was in school, I was in this after-school group called the Whiz Kids, and when people found out, they laughed at me and, you know, all these things. And I'm like, man, I don't care. I think it's cool, and, you know, I'm learning a lot, and some of my friends have jobs. Our policy is literally to hire as many talented engineers as we can find. The whole limit in the system is just that there just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. To get the very best people, we try to make the office as awesome as possible. We have a fantastic chef. Free food. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Free laundry. Snacks. Even places to play and video games and scooters. There's all these kind of interesting things uh, around the office and places where people can play or relax um, or go to think or play music or be creative. Whether you're trying to make a lot of money or whether you just want to change the world, computer programming is an incredibly empowering skill to learn. I think if someone had told me that software is really about humanity, that it's really about helping people by using computer technology, it would have changed my outlook a lot earlier. To be able to actually come up with an idea and then 
see it in your hands and then be able to press a button and have it be in millions of people's hands. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're the first generation in the world that's really ever had that kind of experience. Just to think that, I mean, you can start something in you know, your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and build something that a billion people use as part of their, their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really, it's humbling and it's amazing. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're gonna look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. I think it's amazing. It's, I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Great coders are today's rock stars. That's it. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce our chair of our department, Professor James Demmel. Let's give him a hand, folks. So hello, everyone, and welcome to CS Education Day here at Berkeley. This is a great time to visit us, and you just heard a bunch of famous people explain why. I'm going to give you that same story about how you can have a lot of those experiences here at Berkeley. And that's because our students, the demand is so big because there's never been more demand for it's not working. Computer science education, not just among our own students here in all disciplines, but out in the world. And so we've been working very hard to create new classes and even new majors to satisfy all the demand for students who come here. In fact, uh, it's not just about having fun, it's about making the world a better place, as has been mentioned here. Okay. In fact, we have a class here, a software engineering class. It's called CS169, and its goal is to make the world a better place. And how, does it, how is it organized? They take the students, break them up into teams, and team them up with non-governmental organizations, NGOs like the American Red Cross and Engineers Without Borders, and, and various local businesses to create applications that are actually used out there to make the world a better place. So what are some of the applications people have built, like monitoring how much energy you're using so you can save energy, or using smartphones to detect um, the location of rescue teams and, and where all the, the people are, or connecting mothers and newborns in uh, developing nations with local communities and organizers. And so all of these projects are taken from the classes and then deployed in the real world. And there are hundreds and hundreds of examples on the web page you can check out. And in fact, the class is taught worldwide as a MOOC, a massive online open course taught freely. The first time they did it, 60,000 people from 60 countries signed up to take it. So, and you can just take this for free. So you can, uh, you, if you're ready for it, you can do it now. Now, a lot of this demand for computer science is not just from computer science students, it's from across the campus, from students in every different major and every different discipline. And so just to give some examples, for example, the cog side people, cognitive science, they want to know how the brain works. And so they have all these images of, how, of the inside of people's brains taken from MRIs. They want to use computers to analyze it. And there are a bunch of biologists who have all this data from the human genome, and they want to analyze where do diseases come from and what's the environment look like. And then there's uh, the political science folks who want to know why the election went the way it did and what, what happened with all those polls. I mean, they're, they're, they have all this huge demand for computer science. And in fact, there's this whole industrial revolution, and you heard about it from those people up there in big data, and you can tell how big it is because there's even a popular rock group called Big Data now. You've probably listened to them. And, and so we've started a new class. It's called Data Science 8. It's not called Computer Science. And it's now 500 people a semester from, from every different discipline. And what they do is each week, they pick a different data set from a different discipline, say, what are the interesting questions we could ask about it? And then they teach just enough programming and just enough statistics to answer those interesting questions. And so, for example, one week they might pick a class like on census data and ask, you know, how is the money shifting around different parts of the, the population? Or they might take a text from a book like Huckleberry Finn and ask which characters are likely to get married depending on how often their names appear together in the text. Um, and I hope in a future class they do actually take the polls from the last election and ask, how could the pollsters have gotten it so wrong? Right? So that's another, another kind of thing they can do. 
So, uh, and in fact, this is so popular, we're creating a new major so that students from any different discipline can take this and, and get a degree in data science. Now, of course, computer science is about having lots of fun, too. And so let me just tell one story about a student here. He, um, if you've, have you ever seen uh, a Disney movie with Princess Merida in it? Like, you know, okay. So she has this really fancy curly red hair that bounces around really realistically when she moves it. So that comes from a student project. So we had one of our students spend a summer at Pixar, and he wrote the software that moves Princess Merida's hair around whenever she you know, waves it around or runs or something like that. And so now every movie since then has used his software. And so now, since he was only there for a summer, he doesn't get screen credit. That's the rules at Disney. So his name doesn't actually appear in the movies. But whenever you see Princess Merida's hair, you should think, go bears. So, um, and, so, and what's really fun is the student is now taking some of those same ideas and using that to make hospital MRI scanners work better to scan babies. I was 13 when I first got Did I push a button? Uh, a computer. <laughs> okay. Too much electronics. <laughs> there we go. There. So, okay. And so just to finish, I'll say that in addition to that one student, we have a faculty member in computer graphics who won an Academy Award, an Oscar, for working on this kind of stuff. And so if you ever see something being smashed realistically in a movie, then it might be very well be his software that's making it look that realistic. And so you can check, and that's Professor James O'Brien, and you can check out his webpage for lots of cool videos. And so that's enough examples, and so let me now pass it on to the next speaker. So thank you very much, and have a great day. Good morning. Well, welcome to Berkeley. It is wonderful to see you all here. Um, my name is Naila Nasir. I'm a faculty member here in Education and African American Studies. And I'm also the Vice Chancellor for Equity and Inclusion, which means that my job is about making this place more diverse, more equitable, more inclusive, a welcoming place for all of our students. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start, um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about me, some fun facts about Berkeley, and uh, a couple of pieces of advice, unwarranted, unasked for. But I want you guys to do something for me. So this is the thing about talking with high school students. Um, you all tend to look really bored as audience <laughs> members. And one of the tricks to being a college student, especially in a big lecture hall like this, is to practice looking interested even if you're not terribly <laughs> interested. So for the next five minutes of my comments, I want you to practice your most interesting <laughs> face. Okay, we just take a quick scan. Ah, yes, <laughs> okay, all right, good, good, good. Th that'll come in handy, that'll come in handy. <laughs> um, so I'm from the Bay Area. I went to El Cerrito High. Any, any, any El Cerrito High folks in the house? Ah, oh, oh. um, That's OK. Next year, I'm going to need some El Cerrito High. But this, OK, we have to make that happen. Um, and then I went to Berkeley here as an undergrad um, before you all were born. Um, it's a wonderful place to go to school. It's changed a lot since then, because I'm old. Um, Berkeley is a really special place to be a student um, for a lot of reasons. One, it is the number one public university in the world. In the world. Yes. Um, there are over 30,000 students here at Berkeley and over 1,500 faculty members. What that means is there are folks who are interested in everything. There are courses on things you couldn't even imagine. And the beautiful thing about college which is really different than high school, is you get to pick your own schedule and study the things that you want to study. And so you're not in class like 9 to 3 all day long like you're punching a clock. You might not start class till 10 a.m. You might have class on just Tuesdays and Thursdays. So there's a freedom in it, both in terms of your time, but also in terms of what you choose to study and how you choose to meet the requirements. So it's really, really a wonderful, exciting time. This is an exciting place. One of the things that I really am proud of with respect to what, what Berkeley is, is that we are a public research university. 
And I didn't think too much about that when I was a student here, but when I came back as a faculty member, that started to mean a lot to me. What public means to me, to be a public university, means we are here to serve the public of California. And that means both being a part of the kind of public school pipeline, but it also means that we do research and teach courses in the interest of the public good. We are here to make California and the world a better place, and that's a really important part of our mission. Um, we are also, as I said, a public research university. Um, what it means to be a research university is, you know, college is about taking classes and learning things and being in, in professors' classes. But here it also means we are here as faculty not just to teach, but we do research in our field, which means we are creating knowledge. We are creating the knowledge that shows up in our textbooks, in your textbooks. And taking courses from the people that are creating the knowledge is just a really exciting and fun thing. So that's my commercial for Berkeley. We also have seven, I think it might be eight now, Nobel laureates here on campus. Our Nobel laureates have special parking spots in the middle of campus. Um, I'm super jealous because I'll never have one of those. Um, and and uh, I think there are 29 alumni from Berkeley who have Nobel Prizes. Our computer science department here is one of the best in the world. So the kinds of things you'll be exposed to, the people you will meet, the faculty you'll meet today are the very best in the world at what they do. So I want you to, as you, as you enjoy this beautiful, somewhat cold campus today, um, I want you to, to embrace and imagine what it would feel like to be a student here, what it would feel like to be a student in college. So as you're walking around, engaging with people, seeing the campus, really embrace that, like, this is my place. What would it feel like for this to be my place and, and, and bring your spirit, your energy to this place? Um, and you know, many of you I know have experience in computer science, you're interested in computer science in particular. I think that's wonderful, I think that's extraordinary. Not one of those people. Um, and for those of you who are like me, you might be here, computer science is cool, but maybe not your passion. There are 275 other majors on this campus. Um, and so when Dan says we want, we are, we, we are opening the doors to this campus for you today because we want to, you to be here, we want to enjoy you, we want to meet you, we want you to see what we do, but we also want you to apply to Berkeley. Like that's part of our little underhanded mission here. We want to see you here in a year, in two years, in three years, in four years. And so um, keep us on your list and know that Berkeley is a place for California students coming out of the public schools. That's what we do. This is an amazing place. I know you might think you don't want to be too close to home, but I promise you, when you're on campus, your parents seem super far away. My daughter went here. I barely saw her. So it's, you know, it's like, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to go far away to be in another world. Um, and while I have you here, for those of you who are intended computer science majors or math majors or science majors or pre-med, um, likely in your high schools, you are like the science, computer science superstars. And one of the things about coming here that, that is an adjustment for some students or coming to college generally is that you come and you realize that a lot of people are good at what you're good at. And that's okay. Um, you may also, this is just like a, a note to your future self, you may also, when you come to college, take a class that you think you're going to do amazing in, and it might be a class you're really passionate about, and you might fail the first midterm. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is not to have low expectations for you. I have incredibly high expectations for all of you. But to say that if that happens, that doesn't mean you're not smart. That doesn't mean you're not good at that, at that discipline. That just means you need to work a little harder, you need to work a little differently, and you need to get some support. So don't, we have so many students that come and take a class and don't do well and think, oh shoot, maybe, maybe I thought I was good at this and I'm not, and then they become sociology majors or, or theater majors or something. So I want you to stay on your path. I mean, some people are sociology or theater majors to begin with, you know, no shade, but I just want you to know that a little bit of not doing well doesn't mean you're not on the right path. Okay, that's my soapbox for today. I think the woman on the video said something like, to be a computer scientist doesn't mean you, you have to be a genius, it just means you have to be dedicated. I would say that's true of everything, everything you kind of put your full energy and heart into, even beyond failure, um, you, you're gonna be really, really great at. So I will stop there. Again, welcome, it's so wonderful to see you on campus. I love the days when I get to interact with high school students and folks from the local community. It just brightens up our whole campus and I hope that you have a wonderful, exciting day here at CAF.
slides. That's me. <laughs> I don't want to show myself on the screen. I'll show, I'll show Naive up again. That's much nicer. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Uh, my name is Oscar Dubon. I'm a professor in material science and engineering. I'm also associate dean in the College of Engineering for Student Affairs and uh, Equity and Inclusion. So my job is to bring you all in. It's also to see how you're doing while you're here and also to have a conversation with a few of you who may be having a little bit of trouble and we need to get you back on track. So that's my job. Um, as an engineer, I study the properties of materials. I study how imperfections in crystals uh, affect their electrical properties and their optical properties, how light is absorbed, how electrons flow, how current flows through the materials. So that's what I do. And believe it or not, computer science is extremely important for my field as well, even though I work with materials that, uh, with uh, stuff that you can like, hold on to, for example. Um, so, how many of you want to be a computer scientist? All right. How many of you want to understand computing, want to understand how to use a computer? That's right. Everyone should be, not everyone needs to be a computer scientist, but everyone should understand com different aspects of computer science. You all live in a world where computer science has impacted your lives. Uh, if you have a smartphone, there's coding in there. Um, the future, uh, uh, you're no, you're no long, long you're going to probably need a driver's license. I'm, I'm sorry to break that uh, news to you. Because the car is going to drive itself, right? That's going to require uh, computing, artificial intelligence, robotics. All of these different types of technology require computing. Uh, what about things like uh, social justice? Do you, do you all know what social justice is? Yes, no, maybe? Social justice. Having all voices at the table when decisions are being made. Remember that. Did you know computing is important for social justice? Right? So how are you going to make the argument that you need to be at the table? Or that other people need to be at the table? You need to analyze data. And to analyze data, you need to use computing. That's the way we're, that's how we're moving. Uh, access to higher education. Does it need computing? Yes, we want to know who's moving forward, who's being left behind, why. We're not going to look at two or three people. We're going to look at millions of people and understand those trends. That requires computing, handling large sets of data. Discovery new materials that can lead to new forms of, uh, of uh, computing, uh, new, for, new lighter materials for transportation. Does that need computing? Yes, because we're going to take all this data that's what's happening right now, and developing new materials before we even actually make them. Because we're going to use principles of chemistry and physics and use computing and all the data that's out, out there in the world about materials and find new materials that you're going to be able to use for all the types of uh, technological needs you're going to have. So computing is not something that is just in computer science. Computing, understanding how to manipulate data, being quantitative in whatever you do, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in education, whether it's in a political cause, it's going to make you a stronger advocate for your cause. So I really want you to think about how you can bring out the quantitative inner self in you to make your cause better. Music, Will I Am, one of my Black Eyed Peas, one of my favorite bands. He's a huge, huge advocate of, of STEM education. Because he understands that, uh, you can hear it in his music, of course, that technology is certainly involved in music, but to get advanced in this society, you need to have the, most, the best tools in your toolkit to be able to get the best jobs. And that's going to be knowing how people work, knowing that social science, it's also knowing that quantitative piece, knowing how you can make the case to others by using numbers, that what you're, what you're trying to do is the right thing to do. So as you go on and you see all of these amazing things in technology, in artificial intelligence, in robotics today, I want you to think about what do you want to do 
and how you can bring that quantitative inner self to bear on what your important cause is in your life. Because I guarantee it that it will be much stronger, you'll make a much stronger case if you do that. So with that, I take it all in, and I hope to see you next year in two years. Who, who are seniors? You already applied to Cal, yes? Yeah. Juniors, you're all applying to Cal, right? All right. Sophomores? Yes. Freshmen? Yeah. So I hope to see all of, your, all of you applying to Cal and see some of you make it, if not make it to other schools. Thank you very much.